as you can see, I don't really have much hair, which is a bit of a strange way to start, but I'm always thinking about life and how life is changing. And a lot of this started about three years ago with the birth of my son. So he's going to be three in two weeks' time. Um, and I often think, where, where have we come from in terms of microwave and RF? As, as Helen alluded, I, I do have some experience in that background. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm the greatest salesman, but I love my engineering. Um, that's why I'm here. But then how is it going to affect my son? What's his future going to be like? How's his life going to change? There's some major topics at the moment when you think of high tech. We've had some great talks today from Huawei and also from Sony. But then also we think about the automotive industry. How is that changing at the moment? There's some massive movement, movements in those industries at the moment. So I wanted to have a quick look in the past and, then, and potentially have a look in the future. And then take an example of that of a phased array, which has been quite topical today. Quite a few people have talked about it. So I'm just going to show you some simulations of that. Um, but then also take it a stage further. Because at the end of the day, everyone wants to make a product. And the product won't happen unless you take into account all the different engineering types. You need to sell something. It needs to be low cost. We're looking at IoT coming up. 75 billion devices by 2025. Have we got that many engineers to make all those devices? How, how is this going to happen? Are people going to take shortcuts? Are we going to get the product? Very interesting stuff, very exciting times. So that's why I want to have a look, quick look at a phased array, of which these days we can, we can build a, a brief concept for say a 16 by 16 array in five minutes. Now someone looked at me rather funny when I said that earlier until I actually demonstrated it in front of them. However, you do, we, you do need to look at it a little bit more intricately and get all the correct details to make sure that your measurements and the simulation do marry up perfectly. And then there's also the unforeseen problems. So I'm going to keep that for a little bit later. So let's take you back to the past, a little bit before my time. In the 1900s, you can see that in Fifth Avenue, everywhere was horse and carts, but one automobile, or one vehicle, as I would call it. 13 years later, what do we see? Rapid evolution, I guess, in, in those day and age. And we see one horse and cart. And these days, we're looking at how things are changing. And we're moving from the internal combustion engine to like uh, electric vehicles, connected autonomous vehicles. We're looking at flying taxis. Everything's changing at the moment. And that's great for us. Um, an abundance of jobs potentially for RF and microwave engineers, which is very nice. So when we think about where the car was, it was almost 100% mechanical engineering as such. But then as we progress through the years, quite often it was, where can we put the radio antenna so that it works and get it optimal? Or how can we have it out of sight so no one can see it? When you talk to the person in the street with your high-tech devices, they think it works by magic because there's no antennas. Yeah, a bit strange. And then in today's society, think of all the technological devices that are on it, how it all works. So for me in the morning, I get in my Ford Focus with an antenna in the key fob, um, vast amount of mileage on the clock, doesn't do much else. Oh, the radio does work, which is nice. And then I get in the company car, and all I have to do is pretend that I'm kicking the boot and the boot opens. It's fantastic. Vast amount of microwave and RF engineering goes into all of this. 80% of innovations in the automotive market at the moment, 80% is due to embedded systems. It's a vast amount. 20 to 40% of the developmental costs that go into the vehicle is due to this. And also 60% of development time. So there's a lot of work out there, especially for the microwave RF engineers. 
In fact, a lot of these companies are now employing big teams so that they can do the work for them rather than outsourcing all the work. And when we think beyond this, with the autonomous vehicles, with the flying taxis or flying cars, things are only going to get greater and greater and the pressures on the engineers are going to be huge. So it's not just the technology which is getting which is getting harder, it's getting more sophisticated. Clearly the simulation packages also need to keep up with this so that we can do this. So what's taken, say, the last 100 years, we now need to fit in about 5 years, 10 years, but still ensure that it meets all the rules and regulations and make sure that it all works. These are just a few of the devices within your car. For those who are keen of sight, you will see that antennas are mentioned twice. That's no coincidence. I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. But that's my background. No. It's because in a car you get about 40 to 50 different antennas. You get 150 sensors and about 7 kilometres of cabling. That's a vast amount of design that needs to be done. We've come a long way from having just where can we put the antenna to make the radio work. It now needs to interact with the human body. Someone alluded earlier, what happens with the antenna in the human body? Do we need to take into account the bioelectromagnetics? Yes, we do. We need to make sure that it meets the SAR regulations. But then it also needs to connect to the environment, whether that's nearby buildings, whether that's vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to environment, and all the rest of it. We also need to look at short-range radar, long-range radar at 77 gigahertz. So from a modelling perspective, that's quite interesting. It's, it's a huge modelling task. When we think about the key industrial challenges from an antenna perspective, I don't want to go into all the others because you saw how many topics there were. That would just be crazy. Um, we need to find the optimal position for the antenna. We need to take into account all the interference that's going on. I think today we've said about everything's going at a faster data rate. Things are going to radiate a lot more if you go at a faster data rate. <coughs> Certainly within a, within a handset device, if you change your data buses so they work at a, a faster data rate, they, they emit more. There's a lot more interference. What's the repercussions of that? And also, someone also mentioned about the different environments, whether you're driving along in the, in the rain, in the snow, in the fog, etc. How would you go about simulating that or making sure that it works? Can you do it all in a wind tunnel? And then the other part is, every single engineering department has their own set of tools. And quite often these tools are not connected. So it's quite a slow process. With a microwave and RF in the high-tech industry, we see similar kind of uh, aspects. I remember when I got my first mobile phone, it was like a brick. And yet these days, if you had a mobile phone which you could only talk on, I saw, I saw an advert recently where someone had made a mobile phone about that big. All you could do was talk to someone on it. Absolutely incredible. I mean, we've got, uh, we got Huawei here today, um, and what their phones can do is absolutely fantastic. You know, we've, we're moving up to 5G where you've got the much faster data rates. You can, you can do a vast amount of different things on those phones. But then it also needs to interact with the different environments as well. So in my example later, I'm going to take a technical demonstrator and that of a smart projector. It's not real. This is just, uh, this <laughs> it's just something the, from the mechanical engineering. So it's not real. I know it does look real, and we're going to see the effect of using a phased array within, say, this smart device, and potentially some of the pitfalls. It's broken up so you can see all the different components. It's about the size of an A4 piece of paper, so it's small. Everything these days seems to get smaller and smaller and smaller, although cars seem to be getting bigger, I think. You've got all the different components in there, whether it's the speakers, battery, the frame, the unit. And when this is being built up, the connectivity challenges are, are all too common. You're going to have quite a number of antennas in there, and you need to make them all work reliably. You've also got EMI issues of them talking to each other, 
but also talking to the electronics, which you may not want. For the PCB board, you need to make sure that you've got signal integrity, power integrity. Are things happening as you want them? I think someone also mentioned about thermal aspects, EMC compliance, all these different aspects from different departments. Now, if all the tools are connected, that would be nice, but they don't always talk to each other. And you also need to make sure that you've got the structural integrity from the mechanical side. Otherwise, it's just going to break. If your product breaks, you're going to send it back saying, I, I dropped it, it broke. It's no good. So when you look at the design phase of a product, you get an initial concept. Now, if you're making millions of products, you want to minimize on the amount of wastage. So the mechanical engineer is going to try and minimize the amount of waste, yeah, which is what, what we're doing here. But you also need to make sure that it's um, good for structural integrity if you break it as well. And during all this time, and all the different phases that we're going through, the communication bands that you may want to work on may be changing as well. And at every time, you find that you've got different spaces for your antennas. So the antenna engineer has to really sort of keep in contact, close contact with everyone, and make sure that, it, that all, everything that he's proposing works. So I went to a World Summit recently for connected devices. I was quite surprised that some people were getting off-the-shelf antennas and just placing them in their device going, yep, that'll work. It's like when you think about the installed antenna performance, it doesn't quite always work, does it? Um, mobile phones electrically connect to you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've had talks about that in the past. But there are pros and cons. So if you go for an off-the-shelf, um, it's very quick and easy to get. Quick, quick installation, great, fine. If you're de designing it yourself, you do have full control, which is nice, because if there is a problem with the far-field pattern or, or the connectivity, at least you can alter it. If something goes wrong with the one that you got from off the shelf, what are you going to do? Are you going to buy another one and see what happens then? So, yeah, we got pros and cons all the way. So the typical design cycle, you'd get your CAD, whether this is for a high-tech device or whether, whether it's for a car. You'd get a number of different antenna candidates. You'd try them on the device, potentially simulate it. At some stage, yes, we do need to measure this. But initially, if you're simulating, you can, you can try lots and lots of different options. In some cases, you may be able to install more than one antenna for the same communication band. And then check the total scan pattern. See if you've got complementary <coughs> combinations that will work for you. Once again, we look at the industrial challenges at the high tech. So for an antenna engineer, you'll find that it's almost a identical, well, what I've been talking about, as that of the automotive market. In fact, what I did was to just to take the automotive market and just cross things out. I, I cheated. But it's, st it's still very, very relevant. You still need to make sure that the antenna systems work in the, in the actual place. They need to work in the environments, and there's still disconnects between the different softwares. So now what I want to do is look at the phased array. Okay, it, it's been quite topical today. Um, so yeah, I was, I was quite pleased with that. So for the high-tech example, what I'm going to do is, is place a 2x8 uh, array within my, well, what we call a beaming, which is the smart projector. Equally, we could have put a 2x2 two two array and placed that within a mobile handset. At higher frequencies, with like 5G, et cetera, 28 gigahertz, you're getting quite intricate details. For the automotive market, I'm looking at a long-range radar. This is at 77 gigahertz, so you can imagine how small the features are. Back to beaming. So 28 gigahertz, the thickness of the device is two millimeters. <coughs> so at 28 gigahertz, that's becoming more electrically relevant. Yeah? But it's a phased array. Every, a lot of people here know about phased arrays. This is actually the total scan pattern. So the maximum amount of energy that you'll be getting out at any particular time. Okay? Because you want to scan from, uh, you need a beam width of 160 degrees-ish. 
Because if you walk around and it doesn't work, that would be no good. Okay, and I, I don't want to take you through all the different patterns, etc., because that could take a little bit longer. For the automotive market, we're going to use a transmit and receive array, and we're going to place it behind a radem and then inside the car. So the similarities, I've, I've kind of used arrays in both cases. Because they're arrays, we, we can typically say that the patterns should be quite, yeah, quite predictable, as standalone items anyway. And in both scenarios, we place the antennas behind the materials. So what could go wrong? <laughs> so this, this is where it gets quite interesting because um, I don't think I need to preach to this audience because I'm sure that you're all aware. When you place it behind materials, you need to take it into account. But if you've just grabbed something off the shelf or, or you're quite new, then you do need to think about it a bit more. So the 2 by 8 array, zero degrees. We're quite happy that's quite a nice far field pattern. That's fine. When you scan across to 15 degrees, that's still not too bad. 30 degrees, we're getting a bit rugged. Uh, you, you, may, you may be able to get away with that. You may be happy. 40 degrees. If I asked you what antenna gave you that pattern, you'd say, are you sure that's an antenna? That does not look like an antenna. And if I showed you the one at 60 degrees, um, I'd probably have to find myself a new job. So why is that happening? So essentially we're trying to scan at 60 degrees. So the propagation should be going to the left. But as you can see, the material of, of beaming is now electrically relevant. And a lot, a lot of the energy is actually moving away to the right hand side. So I think you're thinking like 75 billion products. How many people are going to have that sort of problem? And will they know what to do if that does happen? It's quite interesting. Radar on a car. So we've got a transmit and receive antenna. You can see that the S11 one of the two antennas are quite similar. They're not exactly the same because it, you don't quite have the symmetry in the, in the top picture there. So as you can expect, the far field patterns are not quite symmetrical either. Now how this works is that you look at the theta and the phi components for the transmit and receive antenna, and you look at the difference between them. So if the observation point is right in the middle, we can see that there should be no difference between them, as you can see. If the observation point moves, then the phase difference between the two is going to change. And if the observation point moves in the opposite direction, we're going to get a change again. But because there's very little difference between your theta and phi components, that's great. So this should operate more or less between, say, minus 60 plus 60 for this radar. Okay? But that's in free space yet again. So what's going to happen when we place it behind, say, a radome? It gets a little bit more ragged, really. So when you place it behind a radome, we can see we've got areas of concern. The phase differences between the components of 40 degrees, 30 degrees, 10 degrees, and 40 degrees. <coughs> what does that mean? Well, th this could be quite bad news. This means that you could be getting ghosting effects. You could be, your system will be telling you that potentially you have objects where objects don't exist. In an autonomous vehicle, that's not a good thing. On the flip side of the coin, if it's telling you that there isn't things when there are things, that's detrimental. That's terrible. So with both cases, whether you're looking at the high-tech industry or the automotive industry, we could be looking at um, loss of reputation for the autonomous vehicles, connected vehicles. Yeah, that, that could be catastrophic. I don't want to go into that, especially as everyone needs to drive home tonight, so <laughs> we won't go into that. But then furthermore, we're looking at uh, quite high frequencies now. I won't say very, very high, because I'm sure many people here work at higher frequencies as well. But when the simulations are, are based on the smallest cell size of a mesh cell, at 77 gigahertz, when you look at the matching network, you're looking at very fine details. So if you try and mesh it, you're looking at 742 billion mesh cells. 
that's not really going to work on my laptop, is it? So it's ridiculous. So these days what we tend to do is say, OK, use one solver for the intricate details. And then once you have your antenna, or whatever it is, you could use it as a near-field source or a far-field source, and use a hybrid solver. And then that way you can solve it on your laptop or your desktop, etc. So modern technology is keeping up with the change of technology, which is nice. It means that almost you can simulate for most applications. Well, what about the environment? What happens in the environment? How many, how many electromagnetic engineers, electrical, electronic engineers think about the environment too much? You do it to a certain extent. But in an autonomous vehicle, what do you do about rain and mud? If that goes on your radar, think about it. How would you test for this? You could say, what happens in a wind tunnel? In a wind tunnel, you can predict where the mud's going to splatter. Yeah? But we all know that when we go home, you're going to have rain, you're going to have cars coming the other way, you're going to have turbulence caused by trucks, you've got all sorts going on. And you can see there's a vast difference in the amount of mud or debris being collected. Now, if that appears on your radome, that could affect the performance. And I just want to say about the ghosting or non-ghosting effects. And kind, kind, of, <laughs> kind of scary. But fortunately, not everything's just based on the one technique, is it? We have vast amount of techniques. So you can do shooting, bounce, and raise to determine where, where the energy is coming from, where it's going to. You can use filtering effects, near fields, far fields. The filtering effects down here are quite, quite significant. It means that you can determine where most of the energy is coming from and maybe disregard some of the other energy parts. But then we also got things like LiDAR and other, other aspects. Just to give Helen a, a connection into the defence industry, you think about the flying vehicles and also autonomous vehicles or connect, connected autonomous vehicles. And if we consider the top left-hand side, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, get my left and right mixed up, this is more to do with radar cross-section. So certainly a very important aspect of defence but it's now being used in the automotive industry. And then when we think of the high-tech industry, we need to think of the footprints of, of your MIMO or your base stations, etc., and how it goes through the urban canyon. What are the hotspots on, say, a building? And how is that going to affect everything? All these different capabilities and a lot more. So it's very important for the modern-day engineer to keep up to date what, with what are the most recent developments within the software. There is a vast amount. I know when I talk to people, and I was guilty of this myself when I, when I was um, an antenna engineer, you get quite happy designing something and you just get stuck and you think, right, I know how to do that, I'm going to do it this way. Ten years later you think, I still know how to do that, I'm going to do it this way. And you kind of blank out some of the other aspects. Don't blank out the other aspects because they could make your life a whole lot easier. So, in conclusion, technology is growing at a fantastic rate, and the complexity of the simulations and what is required in real life is quite phenomenal. But fortunately, both are accelerating quite very nicely. If you're not familiar with the simulation tools, just, just talk to talk to different people and find out what the true capabilities are. As I mentioned, sometimes the bottleneck is, say, the electromagnetic software, talking with the mechanical software, talking to the aeronautical software. This is now possible. At the touch of a button, you can optimise for the three different softwares or the four different softwares in one go. And that's what's changing. And it's quite, a, quite an amazing thought. What's ideal for the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic engineer is not always optimal for the mechanical engineer. So if you can actually combine the two and at the touch of a button find something that's mutually acceptable, <laughs> that works for you both, that's fantastic. So, yeah, life is changing. 
the future for my son is going to change a whole lot, but I'm very excited for it. So thank you very much for listening, and if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me or please ask.